so excited to introduce you to my guest today. His energy is absolutely contagious, and you are going to love what we have to talk about today. He is Tony Overbay, a licensed marriage and family therapist, speaker, author, and podcast host. Tony spent 10 years working in the software industry before returning to school in his early 30s to get his master's in counseling, and he's been working as a therapist for the past 20 years. Tony has been married to his high school sweetheart for 32 years and has four adult children ages 18, 20, 22, and 24. Tony is an avid runner and he has completed over 150 marathons and ultra marathons, including over a dozen races of 100 miles or more. That makes me want to pass out. I've done a few marathons and yeah. at the end, I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever walk again. But, but Monica, as a therapist, what am I running from? Right? Is that That's what we need true. to address? Let me lay down on my <laughs> couch. And you can, yeah. Why don't you you can talk me through that one? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Well, that's like your fancy bio. Is there anything else you want the viewers to know about you? Yeah, oh, uh, that is a great question. I just, when you were reading the bio, which is always awkward, you know that when you speak and you forget when you hand those out that you have to sit there and smile awkwardly while somebody reads the bio. Uh, but the part that I forget almost about is that 10 years in the computer software industry where I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know that you could really actually enjoy a job. And when you enjoy or find passion in your career, that then you, you're you always thinking about it and you like to watch shows about it and listen to books about it and podcasts. And, and then you just realize, man, this is just part of who I am. And, and I just love that because sometimes I do think, wow, it's weird to think that I spent a decade, that's a long time in an industry uh, doing a job that I just didn't really care for. So there's my two cents of uh, everyone go and, and find your passion, live your dream, all those good things. Such good advice. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you found your way to co coaching and counseling because the world definitely <laughs> needs your expertise here. All right, you're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with the same question I'm asking all of my presenters, but if okay. you had the undivided attention of all the married couples in the entire world for just a few moments, what is the most important concept you could teach them about how to live happily ever after with their spouse? Mm, okay. So I think, uh, I think that I would, I would throw this word out that is used a lot, but I would encourage curiosity. And then I feel like a lot of people talk about that, to be curious about your spouse and know that they have all of their own thoughts and opinions and values and all of their life experiences. But then what I would add is, so I would suggest curiosity with a big old side dish of learning how to step outside of your ego and understanding that sometimes we'll say, oh, no, I'm curious. I want to hear what my spouse has to say, as long as it is in alignment with how I feel, or as, as long as it is something that I don't feel uh, that they are criticizing me when they say it. And and I think this is funny, Monica, because I think this is that concept where when we are even talking about our teenagers or our kids and we say, you know what, you guys can come talk to me about anything, you know, that old story. And then the kid gets a bad grade or they, you know, wreck the car and then they come to tell you. And then you're like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously? You know, so we're, we're teaching our kids off so often that, uh, Actually, you can come tell me anything that I feel like I am ready for as long as you say the right answer. And I feel like we do that with our spouses so often, too, of where we're saying, no, we're two different people. I want to hear your opinion as long as it's not dumb. Right. So that's where I feel like curiosity and learn how to step outside of your ego and know that your default setting is to hear everything through your own filter and see everything through your own lens. So you have to actively, intentionally work to not to not view something through what this means about me or to me. So there's a, there's what I would want to tell the world. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so when do the challenges really begin for couples in a marriage relationship? Like how do they start to show up? Is it like right after you say I do or is there a period of time? Okay, um, can I be very witty and clever with this answer? Of course. Okay, so what if I were to tell you that the problems actually start uh, somewhere along around birth? Uh, so in the womb, <laughs> yeah. you know, are, are coming, exiting the womb. And the mm -hmm. reason I, I just feel like uh, I cannot speak enough about what is set, our setup into a relationship. So uh, allow me to take you back to birth, if that is okay. Yes. Um, right. So, so we've all done it. We've been born. And at that point, uh, we are designed by nature to, to have our needs met. We, we must have those needs met. So we cry. And uh, as a baby, and all of a sudden, somebody is there to feed us, and they're going to change our diaper. And so if you really think about it from the word go, our our default 
um, status is that we express our emotions and people jump and meet our needs. So this is where I say, so that works for two, three years because babies are adorable and they smell good and all that sort of thing. But then, but then they start to turn into these little, little narcissists, these little egotistical creatures that only care about their themselves and having their needs met. So you're and so then my teenagers. Oh, exactly. Right. And, uh, and so that, so, the, and, and they don't and they even go further. Right. So a little egotistical creature that doesn't really understand the plight of others or that sort of thing. So, so I like to say that now we, so we come out of the womb, we, we need our need, needs met, but then we start to be able to communicate and we say, I would like to eat candy corn for dinner, or I would like a pony for my birthday. And so now when the parent says no, then again, start from the beginning and we're, we're wired to say, but I, but I expressed, I emoted, I expressed a need and you're telling me no. So this doesn't line up. And so that's where then this world of attachment comes in. So I have to figure out a way to get my needs met. So do I, do I yell and scream? Um, you know, do I withdraw? Uh, do I become the peacemaker in the family? You know, do I, what do I need to do to get my needs met? Because I would like to have candy corn for dinner. And so that's, and I don't know why I'm picking candy corn. I'm not a huge candy corn fan. Uh, I'm really not, Mike. I don't know if you are. So, so then if I then yell and scream and pout, and then my parent eventually says, okay, this one time, but do not ever ask for it again. You know, that old story. Well, to the little egotistical narcissist, they just say, oh, I figured out how to get my needs met. So I will just express myself until I get my needs met. They might even then start to say the right things. Man, you're right. Uh, you're the best parent in the world, or you're a horrible parent, whatever it is to push those buttons. And the reason I talk about that is so, so now we're setting the stage of um, we do whatever we feel like we need to, to get our needs met. Now we're going to bring that into our relationship. And there's a, another thing we start doing is when somebody doesn't meet our needs, when they don't give us the pony for our birthday, or where we don't get to eat candy for dinner or stay up past our bedtime. Now we're programmed because everything revolves around us. We're also programmed to say, the reason they aren't meeting my needs must be because they don't like me or I'm broken or something's wrong with me. So that's where I, uh, that's, that's called abandonment. So now if you put those two together, so we are going to continually try to do whatever we can to get our needs met, whether we have to be a peacemaker, whether we have to just say, man, you're right. Or I agree with all those things too, because our fear is that if somebody doesn't meet our needs, then that means they don't like me or I'm broken. So this is where I say, and maybe you can see now where I say, that's where this all starts. So now bring that into a relationship. And what do we do in the beginning of a relationship? Everything is great and amazing. And, and I've never felt such a connection before. And then if somebody is saying, uh, you know, do you like, uh, do you like Jane Austen movies? And if you've really never heard of them, or you kind of don't like them, but you really don't want this person to abandon you, then you might say things like, oh, love them. You know, and if they say, what are your, what's your favorite one? You say, oh, I can't pick. I mean, all of them, you know, but really you haven't even watched one because in your mind you're thinking, I'm sure I would like them if this person does. So we, we're even showing up in relationships, not really being authentic and we're, we're kind of, we'll figure it out later and I'll say whatever, because this is my person. So, so anyway, I feel like that's kind of where we go into relationships. And the reason I like to lay it out that way is bless our hearts. We mean well, I mean, we, you know, we don't know what we don't know and we bring all that stuff from childhood and there we are in a relationship. So, uh, so yeah, maybe that wasn't exactly the answer that you were expecting, but, but I think it starts in the womb. Okay. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Not the one I was expecting, but <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to switch gears because I know you love social media. I do. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to know what are the messages we're, that we're hearing on social media by coaches mm. and therapists that may actually be doing damage to our relationships? Yeah, I, I so I so love this question because I feel like um, you know when I was married, the person that that per performed the ceremony gave the kind of the traditional advice of don't ever go to bed angry, oh, <clears throat> things like that. Yeah, that. right. I like your reaction because it sounds great, and it, and basically it's saying okay, let's just make sure we work everything out before we go to bed. But as a marriage therapist, and I'm telling you, Monica, I, I really do. I think when I was promoting a, a recent course, I was counting up maybe. I've worked with 12, 1300 couples now over 15 years. So I feel like 
it, the consistent pattern you see is that we just don't have the tools that we need to to have an amazing marriage until we maybe go through something, you know, until we need, and then we need to find the tools. So we're going to reach out, we're going to buy a summit, a course, and we're going to go to a therapist, we're going to read some books. And even then we are still going to view those tools through our own lens, or we're going to be taking courses with our elbow. Like, Hey, did you hear that? Saying that to our spouse. Yes. And, and so, you know, all those things are going on, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so that's where I feel like take then there's a lot of pop psychology being thrown around. So for example, the don't go to bed angry is basically saying, Hey, stay up till you're incredibly, uh, it's, it's incredibly exhausted. late. Um, you've got, right. You, you're exhausted. You've got the cortisol flowing through your uh, blood. So you're in this fight or flight mode. You can't even access your, your prefrontal cortex where all the smart decision-making is. And eventually one of you is going to finally say the thing that pushes the other one over the top. So they finally withdraw and they say, fine, you're right. Because they just want to go to bed. So does that sound like marital bliss? You know, then we wake up the next day, we, we kind of stay in the bunker for a day or two, we poke our head back out and say, are, are we good? Yeah, I guess so. So I feel like that's the advice that we often hear is, is that we just need to, to just take care of everything and resolve, work everything to resolution. And, uh, and I, I, you know, part of the marriage tips that I teach so often are the goal is to be heard. It's not necessarily to resolve because typically we fall into this dynamic in our relationships where one person just feels like they have to give in, they have to acquiesce for the, for the sake of the marriage. And so what that leads me to say too, is that I, I love this concept of we're so afraid of contention that we avoid tension altogether. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I feel like there's a lot of that message out there too, of it, it's that at all costs avoid, avoid contention, which I agree with, but are we so afraid of that? And we don't have the right tools that then when things get tense in the marriage, do we just shut down or do we avoid having conversations or expressing how we really feel because we're so afraid that the conversation is going to go south or blow up. So I feel like those are some of the messages that, that are maybe doing a little more harm than good. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I think there's a lot of actual bad marriage advice out there. There, there I, is. Yes. Yeah. And I think that it keeps couples stuck and very frustrated yeah. So I'm so glad there's people like us out there in the world trying to clear it all yeah, up. Yeah, right? that's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing that I'm really excited to chat with you about is um, something that you are have specialized in and that you mm -hmm. found, I think that there's a huge need for. Um, and that is, is it possible to live happily ever after if narcissism is part of your relationship? So either if you are the narcissist or if you are living with a narcissist, is it possible to create a happily ever after in that scenario? Okay. Uh, now you have to give me an extra three hours so that we can uh, lay all this out. <laughs> um, but but what a what a good question because that word is being thrown out there on, on a regular basis. I wanted to make the joke that I really even feel like if you can go in and add a, a ominous music when you say the word narcissism, that would help a lot as well. Um, and and yeah, I do. I've got a podcast about narcissism. I actually work with a lot of, of uh, people that are trying to sort out or figure out if they're in relationships with people with narcissistic traits or tendencies or even full-blown narcissistic personality disorder uh, to the point where I've even um, testified in a handful of court cases when we're talking about narcissism. So it is something that there, there's so much information. Talk about bad information out there about things like narcissism. So is it possible? Um, the first thing when you say, I, I appreciate you saying as you know, if you are a narcissist or if you're in a relationship with a narcissist, the, the hardest part about that first part of what you're saying is that a narcissist doesn't know they're a narcissist. They're just awesome. So, uh, so they're just being, they're just doing, they're just controlling, they're just gaslighting. And I'm being maybe too facetious about that. Uh, but let me kind of take a step back. And um, one of the things that I think has helped the most is I've often talked uh, throughout the last five or six years on my virtual couch podcast about my own narcissistic traits and tendencies or my own narcissistic dustings. And I was very intentional about that because anytime I would put out an episode about narcissism, narcissistic traits, gaslighting, whatever that would look like, there would be thousands more downloads. So I knew that there was a need there for people to know or understand more about this. So then, but then I started a new podcast called Waking Up to Narcissism. And I was intentional with the title because I feel like it's waking up to the narcissism in your relationship or waking up to your own narcissistic traits and tendencies. So a, a, a few episodes in, I did a very intentional episode where basically saying, am I the narcissist? 
And, and I, I typically just say that if someone is asking themselves if they are a narcissist, then the answer is no, because they have enough awareness that they are willing to take a look and, and explore and try to find information. But I was also very intentional in that episode to shift over and talk about emotional immaturity. And so if we kind of look at that, I think it's safe to say that we all, because of that abandonment and attachment stuff I talked about earlier, that we all show up in our relationships emotionally immature in certain ways. And so that can look like um, not really being able to tolerate someone else's opinion or uh, or think that I am right, you know, without understanding the fact that uh, another person has a completely different set of life experiences from their nature, their nurture, their birth order, their DNA, their abandonment, their rejection. So, so I feel like emotional immaturity is assuming that that I I am right, and and I feel like emotional maturity is understanding that I know what I know, but I also know that there are things that I don't know. And, and so being able to then go back and talk about what we said earlier, of looking at things with curiosity. And so, uh, and part of that too is, so if you really look at narcissistic personality disorder, uh, it's, it's, it's a series of coping mechanisms that come from childhood uh, as, as somewhat of an, an adaptation to some, somebody not really feeling heard or understood or valued as a child. And so then they are coming from a place where they didn't see a healthy relationship modeled, which is why I love the whole concept of what you're doing here. So they didn't see a healthy relationship modeled. So they don't even know what they don't know. Um, they didn't see a parent maybe taking ownership for something, apologizing for something, or they they grew up in a situation where they basically were an extension of the parent. So if they did something that their parent didn't approve of, then their parent was angry because how could you make me look bad or how can you know how come you don't want to do all the things that I want you to do so it's really it's it's really taken away uh, a kid's autonomy and so then when the kid grows up then um, not seeing somebody take ownership or somebody modeling uh, accountability or apologies or when somebody cannot they they cannot be wrong about something because if they're wrong they're going to they're going to they could be physically abused, emotionally abused, spiritually abused, financially abused. Um, this is where I, I often say that gaslighting is a childhood defense mechanism. So it's coming from a place of, you know, uh, someone growing up and they cannot be wrong because there's a chance that if they're wrong, then they may absolutely feel like they're going to be abandoned or left behind. So so I think it's interesting to lay that stuff out to then say that um, this is the part where I feel like people show up in relationships and they may do that love bombing. They, you know, they may say that, oh man, I love all the same things, kind of what we were talking about earlier. But this is where when you start to go through life and you start to have kids or you graduate from school or you're going and getting the, the adult job or somebody, there's death and sorrow in a family or those sort of things. Now, all of a sudden you're, you're having some uh, things happen in the relationship and, and your own opinion or your own view is going to start to come out and be expressed. And this is where I feel like growth needs to occur. And, and so this is where you start to realize emotional immaturity. So if someone then starts to express their own opinion and the other person says, that's ridiculous, like, I can't believe you think that, or, you know, do you know how that impacts me or affects me? Now is where I feel like we're starting to, to see, is this narcissism in my relationship or is it just emotional immaturity? And that's where I feel like people just don't have the tools to communicate. So a lot of the work that I do is now having people come into my office and they may be uh, wondering if their spouse has these narcissistic traits or tendencies. And, and I've got a really solid framework of communication, which in essence, I feel like with this framework, you're going to see, is it just a matter of people just don't know what they don't know of ways to communicate or take ownership, or are they incapable of seeing outside of their own ego? You know, are they incapable of hearing someone else has an opinion and not take it as criticism? Uh, and, and so that's where I kind of think it's fascinating. I feel like I've just talked myself silly though. Uh, tell me if that's, uh, is that making sense? I guess. So I was going to just rewind for just a second and see okay. if you would, um, give us kind of a working definition of narcissism or maybe like, how do I identify narcissistic tendencies? So yeah. if I'm like in a conversation with someone and I'm like, man, this is not going the yeah, way I think okay. it should, what, like, when can I say, Maybe I'm dealing with a narcissist. Okay, so okay, so maybe, and I'll go back and and talk about one quick thing. So if you look at it as it really, it's a so a series of it's a series of coping strategies that began in childhood, and and it's like an adaptation to a childhood family situation that leaves a kid with unstable self esteem. 
So um, and the, the, the inability to regulate their self-esteem without external validation. So they need someone else to, to, to help them know that they are okay. And so that can either come in a form of they need to feel better than someone, or sometimes they need to always be the victim. So someone will rescue them. And then that can also lead to, to showing up with lower empathy. And so um, when you look at it as this adaptation of, of childhood, uh, you know, this childhood defense mechanisms, then I feel like you can start to see that if you're aware of maybe even your spouse's, uh, uh, how they were raised, you know, how they were parented, you might understand, wow, I wonder if they've ever seen empathy modeled, or I wonder if they've ever seen accountability modeled. And so that can kind of be something to take a look at. But there's some things that are really interesting. There's a there's a concept, uh, get all psychological nerdy, um, called object constancy. And this is one where it's like the ability to maintain, uh, it's, it's a positive emotional connection to somebody, even if you're angry or hurt or frustrated by their behavior. So I feel like sometimes what you see in relationships is that it, it becomes very black or white or very all or nothing thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, somebody with real emotional immaturity or, or narcissistic traits uh, when they feel good about you or life or the kids or, or anything, then everything is going well. Everything is amazing. But then when they um, you, you do something that they don't like, and it can be as simple as say no to one of their requests, now suddenly you are all bad or you're worthless. And then later you might do something good, and then they're back to feeling good about you again. And so that can sometimes have somebody just feeling like this emotional whiplash. Uh, which I think is really difficult. And, and I think another way to, to set the stage of what we're talking about is I love talking about this concept of healthy ego versus this pathological defensive narcissism. So we talked earlier that um, when I was, uh, that I did 10 years in the computer industry. And so if I look back at those times, I was absolutely emotionally immature. And, and, and if I look at the, like this pathological defensive narcissism, um, there's a lady named Eleanor Greenberg, and she has an amazing definition of this, but she says that, that this is a defense against feelings of inferiority. So then the person dons a mask of arrogant superiority in an attempt to convince the world that he or she is special. But inside, the person feels insecure about their self-worth. And so then this facade of superiority is so thin that it's like a balloon. So one small pinprick will deflate it. And, and I feel like this is where you start to see this person becomes really hypersensitive to criticism or minor slights that somebody with more of a healthy ego or sense of self wouldn't even notice. So somebody that starts to take on these emotional immature or narcissistic traits, um, they just take any form of disagreement as serious criticism. And then they often then lash out and they'll devalue anybody they think disagrees with them. And, and so they're constantly on guard trying to protect their status, which is why they will feel like they know more than fill in the blank. Uh, they know more than the doctor. They know more than the therapist. You know, they know more than and so rather than emotional maturity is a saying, oh, yeah, why would I know um, I'm, I'm not a doctor, you know, or I'm not a therapist. And so I'm going to go in and, and be open to, to learning more uh, healthy ego. Think of, of, of Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, people that have had to put themselves out there. So then sometimes people will say, well, they, they must be narcissistic. But I feel like there's a difference in a healthy ego. And so now I take the years that I was a in the computer industry where I didn't know what I didn't know, I felt very insecure. So I tried to pretend that I knew a lot of things. I wanted to sound smart because I didn't, I didn't really even understand uh, how emotionally immature that was, but, but normal healthy ego. So this is a sense of realistic sense of positive self-regard that's based on your actual accomplishments. And so then it's stable because it's, it's, it's because this person is put into their self-image uh, success that came as real hard work. So they found their passion, they found their conviction, and they learn a lot about it. And so then when they're talking about things, they're only going to talk about things confidently that they're confident about. And they're going to admit that there are things that they don't know. And so the reason I put that in there, uh, Monica, is I feel like a lot of times people will come to me and say, yeah, you know, my, my spouse, just they're kind of a know-it-all, or they will cut me off because I disagreed, or you know, and so that's a little bit more of that fragile ego. And there's a there's a saying in narcissism that um, when a, a narcissist or an emotionally immature person, um, any any disagreement, in essence, they they go immediately to shame as if you're telling them that they're a bad husband or father, if you say, oh, I wouldn't have done that, or why did you do that? And so then they lash out to defend their fragile ego. So that might be using anger or withdrawal or gaslighting or any of those kind of things. So, so I feel like, uh, I don't know if that kind of gives you an idea of what to look for. Um, and then I was talking earlier about this framework and, and I'll just spend a second on this, but I, 
I have this, uh, these four pillars of a connected conversation that I think, I mean, I've got, this is what I've been working on. I feel like the last decade of my marriage therapy career. And so I feel like people just feel crazy sometimes when they're talking to a narcissist or an emotionally immature person, that concept of gaslighting, where by the time you're done having a conversation with somebody, you really are questioning your sanity, or if you really are seeing the world a certain way. So my four pillars of a connected conversation that I that I use to kind of see, can this couple communicate well, is I try to put this framework in of where, okay, um, my first pillar is assuming good intentions, that, that no one wakes up in the morning and thinks, how can I hurt my spouse? Uh, you know, you know what I'll do? I'll wait till the five o'clock tonight and I'll leave this glass out on the counter and that'll, that'll get them, you know, that uh, no one does that. My second pillar is that you can't um, say that uh, that's ridiculous or I disagree with somebody, even if you think what they're doing is, is ridiculous or you disagree, because what we're trying to do is stay in the conversation, which leads to the third, my third pillar, which is I'm going to ask questions before I'm going to make comments, because I really, here comes that curiosity. And so if I, if, if somebody uh, shows up and, and let me give a better example than the, the glass, but I had an example recently where um, a wife said to her husband that I really feel like you come home and you just don't really care about me, that you're very dismissive. And so in emotional immature land, he's going to lash out and say, are you kidding me? You, you know, do you know how hard I work or do you know all the things I do? Or, well, you don't, it's not like you say something to me, you know, it's not like you uh, come up and give me a kiss, but this framework is then he has to assume good intentions or there's a reason why she's expressing herself. And so that's going to lead to curiosity. So um, he's going to say, tell me more, you know, and then my second pillar is whatever she's going to say right now, he can't say that's ridiculous, or I don't believe you, even if he feels that's the case, because any of these things are going to take a conversation out in the weeds. And now we're not even going to be talking about what what she wants to bring up. Uh, so in that scenario, um, he's going to say, okay, hey, tell me more about why you feel that I'm not here for you, or why I feel like you feel like I'm being dismissive. Um, help me see my blind spots. Like there's emotional maturity. I'm willing to to hear something, even if I disagree with it. And then um, because I'm going to find out some information. So even if this guy has been going to, I am there for my spouse school every day, and he knows that he's he is showing up and and being there, telling her that that's ridiculous is not going to foster a, a connected relationship. And then my fourth pillar, which ironically a lot of guys are really bad at. Is, is staying present, leaning in and not going into almost a victim mindset. So in this scenario I'm giving you, um, if she says, you know, I really don't feel like you're there for me. I feel like you come home and you're just pretty dismissive. Um, he has to, okay, she's not trying to hurt me or there's a reason why she's saying she's what she's saying, pillar one. Pillar two, I can't just jump in and say, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. Even if he feels that way, pillar three is he's going to say, tell me more about that because that would be really hard if you feel that way. I mean, I want you to be able to express yourself. He can do all three of those and say, okay, well, I guess you can just tell me what to do. I'm just a big you know, walking paycheck because then he wants her to rescue him, right? So he's staying present. And in this scenario, which I think was so beautiful, um, he heard her and then she said, okay, well, you come in and you just grab one of the kids and you go in the backyard and, and then I don't see you for 15 minutes. And so then now he becomes um, you know, speaker and I have her be listener. Now she has to, okay, she felt heard and understood. And now she has to do the same thing. What he's going to say, she has to assume good intentions, can't say that's ridiculous, ask questions and stay present. Because in that scenario, which was so, so powerful, um, this guy said, man, thank you so much for sharing that, because that would be hard if you feel like I'm not there for you. You know, I, I felt like when you've told me before that you, you seem to be overwhelmed by the kids and you can't wait till I get home for relief, that I felt like I was doing a good thing by just grabbing a kid and running into the backyard. So now she was saying, man, thank you so much, because that again, I, I didn't even look at that that way. I appreciate that. You know, what would it look like if you just asked me about my day or we, or we exchanged a kiss or, you know, that sort of thing. And then that's where he's saying, I, I really appreciate that. So that's where I feel like emotional maturity using this framework is amazing. Now, emotional immaturity or narcissism, we're not even going to get close to those four pillars because the person is going to feel attacked. So I talked about earlier, he's going to defend his fragile ego. He's going to say, He's going to shut down emotionally. He's going to say, I guess I can't do anything right. Or, okay, but you don't understand you know, what you're doing. And that's where I feel like we start to see these, these narcissistic traits or this emotional immaturity. So, uh, so there's all you ever needed to know about uh, emotional immaturity and narcissism. Excellent. Well, I want to circle back real quick and then yeah. we'll take this conversation to the VIP area. Okay. Uh, but I just want to know, 
in your experience, is it possible to learn to live happily with a narcissist? Mm -hmm. So if you're watching this and you're like, it's possible my spouse is a bit of a narcissist and is it possible to get help or to um, somehow mitigate the effects of that so that you can live happily ever after? So I, I really appreciate this. I'm not just saying that because that's what we say when we want to build space before we answer, because I'm going to go to one of my go-tos here. Uh, the whole reason that I started, not the whole reason, but one of the big reasons I started the Waking Up to Narcissism podcast is when someone does start to recognize these narcissistic traits and tendencies, and let's say that they they go to Dr. Google, you know, they're going to Google old narcissism. Um, I'm kind of being uh, humorous with this, but there's reality in it where you'll see it, it. You'll find things that say, don't even finish this paragraph, you know, just leave. And and I get that, but it's the concept of, but there's real life and people are, they have uh, enmeshed finances, they have kids, they have, you know, their uh, social capital, they have um, their their community, their families. And so there's so much more there that I feel like, and again, because narcissism is thrown out so often and there are, there are bad examples. There are horrific examples I've worked with of people that are just are just the, these uh, malignant, malicious narcissists. So, so I understand that even what I'm about to say, if somebody's been through true narcissistic abuse, they're going to think that I'm insane. But, but I, I would say that everybody has to kind of figure this out or go through it in the best way that they can. So I've got these five things that I say that somebody needs to do to to be or interact in a relationship with a narcissist. And what I think you'll find is it's going to either change the dynamic of the relationship, or I feel like it's going to put the person in a position where they can make a, a, a difficult decision. My first thing is I say that they have to raise their emotional baseline. And that's one of the comments that I've, I, you know, I've, I've been talking about the, I made up the emotional baseline, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. And it's just a way to, it's an, it's a really fancy way to talk about self-care that when we are feeling down and overwhelmed, our baseline of emotion is low, but all the decisions coming at us are coming at us from this place, the same place every day. And we're going to respond better when we are in a better emotional state. So raising one's emotional baseline can be anything from uh, going on a run, reading a book, petting a dog, doing a craft. And oftentimes when people feel overwhelmed and down, they feel like that's the last thing I want to do. Or how is a 15 minute walk going to do anything for me when I feel like I don't feel like I'm I'm uh, in a healthy relationship or I'm a good parent or, and and it's the concept of anything other than ruminating or beating yourself up is going to be a plus. So self care is absolutely not selfish. That's where I say, all right, pillar or, or not pillar. Uh, the first thing to do is raise your emotional baseline. The second thing I say is get your PhD in gaslighting because now it's time to understand that that I'm not crazy when I say that the sky is blue if even if he's going to argue with me until I say fine it's purple I, you're right I guess I never knew you know and I know that's not a, a legitimate example but the concepts of gaslighting I think a lot of people are very familiar with the third thing I talk about so so you raise your emotional baseline you get your PhD in gaslighting the third thing is you get out of unhealthy conversations because how often then do people just get in these conversations where they're just going around and around in circles uh, being gaslit or they feel worn down. And so they feel like, I don't even know what to do. So they just sit there and in essence, take it. And that only then feeds the the narcissist supply where they're going to feel like they're, see, you know, you're not saying anything, you know, you're wrong, that sort of thing. So that third one is get out of unproductive conversations. My fourth one is learn how to set healthy boundaries. And so when you're kind of working through these, these steps, uh, healthy boundaries are going to be, I, I am going to leave if you're if you're cursing at me, you know, or if you're yelling at me, I'm going to exit the situation. Now, that doesn't mean that the person is going to say, OK, I can respect that. No, but setting boundaries um, with a narcissist or somebody who's emotionally immature, I often say that setting a boundary, it, it literally becomes almost like a target because they're going to go and attack that boundary because they want control. But you need to start somewhere by setting a boundary. But the fifth thing that I talk about, which I think is the most important, is realize that there's nothing that you will say or do that will cause them to have the aha moment or the epiphany. And so oftentimes people are continuing to engage in these unproductive conversations with no boundaries, being gaslit because they keep thinking that, no, I can I can explain and I'll give this analogy or I'll give an example and you will finally go, oh, okay. But when you're really dealing with narcissism or emotional immaturity, every single thing that you're throwing out there like that, you're in essence handing them your playbook or showing them your buttons. So then later in an argument or a fight, they're going to use those against you. So when I can get people to, to start by using those five techniques, 
one of two things really does happen. One is that they start to show up differently in the relationship. And then that's where then they, they may see their spouse show up differently as well, or they start to gain confidence and they start to see that this isn't a viable or a healthy relationship. And, and so often people don't even want to go to counseling or they don't want to even know, you know, they don't want to dig into this deeper because then they're going to have to deal with it. And so that's where I say, um, start with, you know, these five things that I'm talking about, raising your baseline, self-care, PhD in gaslighting, get out of unproductive conversations, set healthy boundaries, and know that you aren't going to cause them to have the aha moment. And it'll start to make you feel a little bit more um, confident or this sense of purpose. And I feel like that's when you can start to have a better way to evaluate what's going on in your relationship and then maybe start to seek help. Fair. I don't know if I answered the, I don't know if I answered the question, Monica. Do you think it's possible to live happily so, ever after? I have seen it. I mean, and this is where I, I mean, I know I want to be real with uh, with you and with the uh, with listeners is that it's it's not it, it's difficult. It's a lot of work. And I think the hard part is because typically one person is is beginning to wake up to the the narcissism in the relationship. And uh, on my narcissism podcast, it's interesting. I've got a very large group of women that are in relationships with narcissistic and I, I just say entities or people. It can be a spouse, a parent, a sibling, uh, a, an organization, a boss. Um, and I and I've been putting the call out for men. Um, if they are feel like they are under, starting to wake up to their own narcissistic traits and tendencies, and I and I've had my first group meeting where I have a fair amount of guys that are starting to say, okay, I'm willing to take a look at this, and so I do feel it's possible, but it's also difficult because sometimes you know if it's a true emotionally mature narcissistic person, then they can learn to don the mask of here's what a healthy relationship would look like, and then at some point I call it shelf life where then you know, the enough buttons get pushed. And then all of a sudden I feel like then they just say, okay, I fine. I don't know what else to do. I was doing all these things. And, and in essence, you are still not, you know, going back into your role of being uh, someone that I can control. So I have seen it. Um, and I feel like we don't know until we know. So being able to get these tools and then start to live in a more intentional of uh then you are going to see if that is possible but so that boy i just did it again i didn't answer again but yes it is but i don't want to give someone false hope but i want to give them some hope and, and at least some direction on where to go next okay very good well <laughs> let's end there with the direction of if if you're waking up to some narcissism in your relationship where to where where should you go yeah it's a great question too because i feel like what happens um and I see the people show up on my Facebook group this way of it just, you, you first didn't know what you didn't know. Then all of a sudden you start to feel heard and understood. I read a lot of uh, listener emails in this particular podcast because people feel like they're alone. And so they start to feel like uh, the comments I get so often are, I felt like you were in the room listening to the argument. I felt like you were in the car. I felt like you, you know, must uh, have bugged my home or that sort of thing. And so they start to just feel like oh my gosh, I did. I thought I was the only one. And then I feel like typically then people drink from a fire hose of listening to there's, you know, there's no scarcity mindset in, in the coaching or therapy world, right? We want people to get the information that they can get. And there are a lot of podcasts out there um, about narcissism. There's books about narcissism. And so I feel like people go through a big old, uh, sometimes when I say get your PhD in gaslighting, there's a meme that goes around that says I went in for therapy and I came out with a, you know, a, a PhD in personality disorders. So I feel like you start to then really just, just eat up all the information you can, but then I still feel like it's a pretty scary step. Sometimes the next step to then try to bring this up with your spouse because they may not react well. So, so I feel like the first thing to do is just, just devour information so that you can start to feel like you're not alone or you're not crazy. If you can find a support group, um, that's a good thing too. But so often people that are in these relationships have been, uh, we call it sequestered. They've been isolated. You know, they're encouraged not to talk about their relationship from the narcissist because the narcissist knows that that they are not probably being the, the greatest partner in the world. So, and that's where a lot of the love bombing and this whole cycle of, of abuse can happen where there can be a real negative experience and then a, a deep apology. And then there's a time period where things seem to be okay until it just happens again. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of resources online. And and so I think that's the first place is just you go into this, just you can't get enough information. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Let the viewers know where they can find you and your podcast and learn more about your work. 
Thank, oh, I appreciate it. I'm the world's worst salesman. So thank you for, I would have forgotten that whole thing. So go to tonyoverbeta.com and you can get access to, I have a magnetic marriage course. I've got a, a pornography recovery course uh, called The Path Back. Um, and I've got podcasts. Boy, do I have podcasts now. Virtual Couch has been out five or six years and Waking Up to Narcissism is, uh, is I think, seven or eight months old. And then I have a, a new uh, marriage coaching podcast, the, the Magnetic Marriage uh, Podcast, where I'm coaching real couples. And that has been phenomenal. So for people that have never um, heard or, or been to therapy, wonder what it would be like. I think it's really fascinating to listen to a couple be coached. And so that, and then I've got a best-selling book called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict Answer Your Questions that the, my co-author and I, instead of doing an audio book, we are doing a, um, an enhanced podcast where we're basically reading the book and doing some commentary. So um, all that will be available at uh, TonyOverbay.com. Perfect. To learn more ways to deepen your intimacy and strengthen your relationship, make sure you watch this video next.